Let's go ahead. At long and faithful last, we are back to the Old Testament. And I had to go back and look. We hadn't done our Old Testament studies since July. And then we did our, we took a little break because breaks are good. Refresh yourself, you know. We did our devotional stuff that we talked about. Uh, and then I was on vacation and funerals and then I had the plague. So we are finally, since July, we're back to the Old Testament. So uh, we do need to, we'll do a little bit of kind of review before we talk about uh, what we're going to talk about today. But before we do that, let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Come on in. No worries. So, yes, that, that is most essential. Um. After the coffee. Oh, I'm sorry. That was blasphemy. The Bible's most essential and then the coffee. Okay. So before we talk Old Testament, I did want to tell you, since I spent time away from you, I should probably account for my actions. And uh, had a very, actually, the best uh, district pastor's conference that I've had since I've been in the ministry. Uh, and I think, I don't want you to think that I'm like, uh, uh, what would you say? A malcontent, but generally I just have very low expectations about district things. And I go and I get the stuff and I'm like, huh, all of the worship services are just out of the hymnal. And there was no praise band. There was no like contemporary work. I'm like, what's going on? And so, you know, we what we would do is every morning we would have morning devotions and is usually one of the um, one of our vice presidents would do the devotion. And then they always have one communion service, and that was Tuesday night, or Monday night, I think. So I'm like, well, let's see what they do here. We're like, we're going to do divine service setting three, right out of the hymnal. Like, you know, page 15, the common service. And I'm like, really? And I get in there, I sit down, I'm like, they've got a chalice? There's no, like, grape juice? There's no, like, gluten-free? I was like, this is really cool. I can, I can actually commune this year. Uh, so, <laughs> and I'm like, um, and then the speakers actually were really good. Now, um, I'm sure that somebody somewhere probably had a concern about this, but our keynote speaker was a guy named Rod Dreher. Um, and Rod Dreher uh, wears a couple of different hats. Uh, he is the senior editor of the magazine, The American Conservative. So that gives you an idea of what his political views are. Um, but he is not just like a political pundit. Um, and he didn't really talk. He didn't say anything about politics or anything like that. Uh, but he's also a commentator on the sort of cultural situation in which, uh, as American Christians, we find ourselves. And he's written a few books. Um, uh, the one that kind of made him famous was a book called The Benedict Option. Um, and The Benedict Option basically was just about how to survive in our culture um, and in our world, Christians need to do things like, oh, I don't know, pray, go to church, uh, learn the scriptures, and especially be in community and understand that as things continue to fall apart, we need each other. So it, like the thesis of the book is not really that original, but uh, he called it the Benedict option, and he kind of based it on um, the way the monks used to live, you know, the, the Benedictine monks that lived in community. And as, as Western civilization, the Roman Empire, whatever, as all that falls apart, these communities, you know, that the churches build survive, you know. Uh, so it's really good. Uh, because a lot of times what you get at district conferences is usually some guy from like an evangelical seminary talking to you about church growth. And you're just like, oh, man. <laughs> 
And, How do you and spell his name? Uh, Dreher is D R E H E R. That was my grandmother's name. Really? Yeah. Okay. I wonder if that's some distant relation. Maybe. Well, you know, he's a, he's a southerner like me. Oh, so right. yeah, he uh, he uh, most recently lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and now he like I don't know why, but he divides his time between Louisiana and uh, Budapest, Hungary. Very interesting choice. I don't, I don't know why that would be, um, but uh, he was really good. And it's like the thing is, I didn't. I wouldn't say I wouldn't agree with everything that he said. He's also he's not a Lutheran. He's Eastern Orthodox, which is interesting. But it's just nice to have people talk about things that matter, you know, where we're not talking about like silly stuff. Because um, I'm just celebrity. Just doesn't it doesn't impress me. Uh, but uh, it was good. It was good to have, and we all, they always have a, a seminary professor, so he gave his talks, he was good. Had another guy, um, who I think was one of the directors for like KFUO or some, or uh, Lutheran Hour. So all of them together, it was really actually good. Like we had a good time. Uh, gave him a nice evaluation. I said, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I did talk to Rod Dreher one time. I saw him in the beer line on, uh, I think it was Tuesday. And like I said, you know, he's, he's Eastern Orthodox. So I was up there. I was getting this right. Okay. But, uh, yeah, not indoors. But um, so I'm standing there, and he turns around and he goes, hey, it's not too late to be an Eastern Orthodox priest. You know, you got the, you got, and I was like, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so that was my deep talk with Rod Dreher. Um, but anyway, so thank you. I do appreciate, you know, that the church does allocate money to send me to conferences and stuff. And uh, you'll be happy to know it was not a waste of time this year. So it's never a waste of time because I like to see my friends and network with people and whatever. But it's just great when the worship's great and the talks are great and the food's always good. You know, if you go to the Grand Lodge in Boyne Falls, you know, the food's good. But so anyway, that's what I did last week instead of Bible study. Um, one housekeeping note, because I do have to, Speaking of district things, so our new district president, President Davis, uh, is doing this thing where he wants to sit down and meet, get to know the young pastors in the Michigan district. So if you're under 40, he wants to do lunch and stuff. Uh, he's doing like a couple of different locations around the state. So our location is Higgins Lake, and I went ahead, since I was invited, to uh, have lunch with the district president. Uh, I decided I'd go ahead and go and be polite and, uh, you know, get to know him. That's going to be on a Wednesday. All right. So that's uh, November the 2nd. So what I'm asking, if we did Bible study the day before on Tuesday, November the 1st at our regular time, would you all come be okay with that? Uh, I do know there's an LCF meeting at 1 o'clock that day. Is the, the whole day here, huh? Yeah, because I looked at the count. So, Kay, uh, Shannon, Kay says that that's a Sunday one. But on our calendar in there, that is Tuesday, right? No, last week we said it changed it because that Sunday would be um, new members. Yeah, that's yeah, Sunday, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we need to wear the t-shirt. <laughs> okay. So, but it is actually then th that Tuesday. So, okay. So Shannon is saying that LCF is actually that Tuesday. So, you know, we do our usual thing. We get out at 1130 and, you know, you and I can hang out or you can go home or whatever. John, you can go home. You know, you don't have to stay for LCF. Uh, but yeah, well, if, if y'all are willing to come, you can stay. They got good food. Um, so if you're okay with that, then we'll go ahead and, cause I really hate to miss. And now like, I don't have any excuse, like I'm not deathly ill. So um, instead of November the 2nd, we'll do Tuesday, November the 1st. So that's not this coming, but the next, right? Yeah, cause I think that's October 26th, something like that. So yeah, okay, cool. So where are you going? I will be in Higgins Lake hobnobbing with the wizardry. What this is really about is he's looking for people uh, to be like in district higher up stuff. And just so y'all know, I have no interest. 
I'm getting a free lunch, okay? And you get to sit down with the district president, and he's new, you know, so that's good. You know, make connections and things like that. But I am, ask not what I can do for the district, but what the district can do for me. So, all right. Enough of that. Uh, where we stopped back in July, we are still, we got out of Egypt. Uh, we received the law from God on Mount Sinai. And uh, we've, we've kind of, remember what, what this study is about is just hitting the highlights of the Old Testament. So we're not going strictly um, from one end of the book to the other, anything like that. So we're kind of bouncing through the Pentateuch, five books of Moses. And where we stopped last time, I don't expect you to recall this, but uh, I didn't recall it till I looked at my notes. But last time, we talked about really two major things. Remember that they are headed for the promised land, for the land of Canaan. And God has sent the spies through Moses. He sent the spies to go spy out the land. They go into Canaan. And remember, the only two who give a positive report are Joshua and Caleb. The others have nothing good to say about it. They're like, these people are huge. Uh, they are well fortified. And Caleb and Joshua are like, no, we can take them because God said that this land is our land and uh, we can do it because the Lord is on our side. And all the other, the other um, spies are like, no, can't do it. So that's finally when God gets to the point that he says, okay. Uh, and, and they incite the people against Moses and Aaron, saying they're trying to kill us. We've heard that before. Remember, every time they, they run into a problem, Moses and Aaron, they're trying to kill us, right? And they quarrel and they grumble. It's not, I have a concern. It's, I know what your motive is. You're trying to kill us all. Okay. Uh, thankfully, we never quarrel in churches. But... Uh, <laughs> So God finally says, all right, well, this generation will not go into the promised land. They will die, except for Caleb and Joshua. They can come in. But all y'all, the rest of you who don't have faith in me, uh, you're going to wander around pretty much like this in this wilderness for the next 40 years. When you're all dead, your children can go in. And Caleb and Joshua. And up to this point, we would assume Moses and Aaron. And today that's going to change because God reaches his limit with Moses <laughs> and Aaron. Um, so we saw that. Then the, the last thing that we saw uh, was Korah's rebellion. It was Korah and his sons who decided, hey, man, like, we all know who God is. We can all offer the sacrifices and the incense. And uh, Moses says, you, you want to bet? So he's like, why don't you come out and try? And they do. And the earth opens and swallows them up. And then Aaron goes out and makes atonement as quick as he can for the people's sins, you know, so God doesn't swallow them all, you know, and kill them all. Uh, a little lesson in when God duly constitutes and institutes authority, we go with what God said. Moses and Aaron are really not in a very enviable position, as we know, because of what they have to deal with, with the people of Israel. And it's only going to get worse today. So that's where we stop. Uh, anything about that? Any comment or anything before we plow forward? Okay. My little sign here. Numbers chapter 20. Everybody has a sheet? Yes? Okay. Numbers 20. Okay. And to skip around a little bit, uh, but uh, we'll start, I'll read verse 1, and then I'll let somebody else read about the waters of Meribah. So beginning in verse 1, and the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Miriam was Moses and Aaron's sister that we've seen, she crops up a little bit here and there. Um, in the story. But just a historical note, Miriam dies. Uh, the first month of what is a good question. And I tend to think it's uh, the first month of the 40th year. So we've actually, and I'll show you why when we, as we move on, but we finally got like, we're, we're to the last, we had, had a few good funerals, we took care of all the problem people, you know, and uh, we're in the 40th year. So this year, we're going to go into the promised land because we served our time. 
And I'll show you why I think that is uh, in a minute. It's the first month of the 40th year. We're getting to the end of our wandering. Um, so, all right, that brings us then. Would somebody read for us about the waters of Meribah, which is verses two through nine? Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went up from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take that, take the staff, and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock. And tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them to give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Okay, thank you. Now, you know how things repeat sometimes in life. And we have seen before. Well, there's two things that we've seen before. One, like we mentioned, every time there's a problem. And I grant you. If they've run out of water, I'd be concerned too. But every time there's a problem, there are these accusations that are made against Moses and Aaron. That you, by your negligence, are trying to kill us, and we don't really like the location of where we are right now. Not a place for grain and vines and whatever else. And not only will we die, but the cattle are going to die too. And you're like, okay, well, uh, remember the manna? <laughs> remember the quail? Remember... And this is the second thing. Remember the last time I gave you water out of a rock? Because that's already happened before. Uh, that was Exodus 17. And that was where God, now God says something different to Moses. Because what is Moses supposed to do with the rock this time? Yes. What did he say last time? Strike it. Strike it. Hmm. So, and he did last time when God said, take your staff. Remember the staff of God. The one that turns you know, water in the blood and there's all this other stuff. Um, take the staff, strike the rock. He did. Now, of course, do they moan and complain? Yes, uh, but they get their water. So we're in the same situation. They have seen a hundred times now how God has provided for them, how he's done all these things for his people. They still don't trust that he's going to. They're still going to accuse God's, you know, his, the authorities that he appoints of sinning against them. And so it's like, all right, well, it's the same kind of story again. But this time God says, speak to the rock. So is he going to do it? Well, but somebody read for us uh, 10 through 13. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and where he showed himself holy among them. Okay, thank you. Big mistake. Okay. Now look at what though what Moses says. You rebels. Uh, the way the ESV has is very similar uh, uh, to Carol's. But shall we bring water out of this rock? Shall I? Yeah, I've got the word we circled. So apparently sometime somebody else has brought that out. Yeah. Well, well good. Good. I'm glad. No, I'm not out to lunch on this one. Uh, well, who's really doing the doing here? I mean, is it Moses? Is the staff magic? No. And we know this, you know, from the scriptures that 
when God uses means to accomplish something, it's, it's because of God's word, right? Um, you can sprinkle somebody with water and that doesn't do anything. But if it's water connected with God's word and baptism, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's a baptism. We can eat bread and wine all day long, but without uh, the words of Jesus that make it a sacrament, it wouldn't be Jesus' body and blood. <clears throat> but Moses is taking the credit, you know. Shall we do this, you rebels, you know? And uh, it's not him, you know. It's not him, it's not Moses or Aaron, it's not the staff. The surprising thing about it, though, is uh, he, he violates God's word, but God still gives him the water out of the rock which is interesting, I think. Because um, there's no guarantee that God's still going to do what he said if you don't do it the way that God said to do it. You know what I mean? Um, but he strikes the rock. And he doesn't just strike it once, but he strikes it twice. He's like, let me show you what I can do, you rebels. Um, and, uh, and it still comes out abundantly, and the congregation and the cows get to drink. And that's, as we said, we saw last time, God has been tested by these people for very, very long. And finally, because of the bad report of the spies that scout out the land of Canaan, that generation will not go into the promised land. That did not apply to Moses or Aaron or Joshua or Caleb. But because Moses and Aaron together have done this. And you see what God says they've done in verse 12. What is their actual sin? Mm-hmm. All this stuff that God says, be holy for I am holy. Um, and uh, we've talked before when we went through the Ten Commandments, how is God's name kept holy? Well, that's the Lord's Prayer. But that's also the Second Commandment. You know, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. So how do you use the name of the Lord your God? Uh, thank, praise, serve, obey, um, call upon him, like we talked about when we did our thing about prayer. Uh and by, by our doctrine and also by our life and our works, this is how we hold God as holy. Do what he says. <laughs> you believe his word. And, and the, the concrete, you know, the manifestation of that faith and belief is doing that which he says. This was not a hard one, right? This was not, you know, you shall not commit adultery, so watch your dirty thoughts. It was just talk to the rock, okay? Just, just tell it what to do and the rock will do it. Not that much of a stretch. You know, Moses, like, he's been at the head of this thing the whole time. Uh, but, and, and I, maybe it goes to show, too, that uh, it really is true. The people can rub off on you, you know. That doesn't make you and me saints or anything. But uh, it, I'm sure it would have been a tough gig, wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, listening to his belly aching and complaining all the time. And... Uh, and, you know, Moses and Aaron are the ones who have, like, these audiences with God, you know, that they go to the, the tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle. They speak to him. And uh, it's just a hard, it's a hard thing that just kind of rubs off on them. Moses has reached his limit. But the problem is, is that Moses is a sinner, right? And uh, we're led sometimes when we lose our patience in the sin. He obviously is not like, I love y'all so much. I'm going to provide water for you. He's like, look here, you rebels. You little brats. That's right, you heathens. You want, you want water? I'm going to give you water. Now take your water and quit your complaining. Um, eat your food and quit complaining. Um, so, but, but the problem is, is that Moses and Aaron, this is a breach of faith, that they don't trust what God has said. If they did, they would have done what he said. It was not a hard one to do. Uh, and they, they have made God then less than holy, you know. God is something I can just manipulate, you know. Genie, hit the rock, get what I want, and then I come out, you know, looking like, you know, I'm the one, really it was me who did it. Because I've, I've got that line with God. And so God says, you and Aaron will not enter the promised land. And you might think, well, God seems kind of harsh, <laughs> kind of impatient. Um... But, you know, God has put up with this for a long, long time. Uh, and so, and he's not saying you're condemned to hell. He just said there is an earthly and temporal consequence for some of the things we do. And we know that. You rob a bank. Uh, the banker can forgive you. But the cops usually are not going to be like, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> he's forgiven. You just go ahead and walk, you know. 
there's a debt that's to be paid and we have to teach everybody else not to do what you did, you know. So that's, that's his temporal consequence. You and Aaron will not go into the promised land. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And because it, what it looks like here, this looks like magic. You know, it looks like I've got the power instead of saying, e even though I, as Moses, I'm the prophet of Israel, Aaron's the high priest, but we are, we are under God. And that's why it's a problem when they quarrel against Moses and Aaron, because it's, and, and they will say that continually. It is not, it's not Aaron and me that you're quarreling with. It's God. You might want to watch out. Um, but yeah, instead of upholding God is holy, God is sovereign. God is the one who's going to provide. Moses goes, look what I can do. Rebel. Uh, because God, I mean, God has been angry with the, the Israelites before, but here he, it doesn't, he doesn't say that. He just says, give them the water. So why, sh why should Moses act like he's angry if God's not angry? Because Moses is not God. It's not for him to get mad about it. Um, but Moses is on a little bit of a power trip right now, and God just won't tolerate it anymore. Mm. Well, that could be because we also know that um, there have been times where God has been the one to say to Moses, Moses, if you just step five feet that way, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm sick of this. And Moses is the one who stands in the gap as the priest. And he says, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, and he, he appeals to God's name. He says, the Egyptians will say that you're weak. They'll say that you couldn't do it. And nobody will honor you. You kill them all, they're not going to worship you, <laughs> you know. So God, and of course we know that God, this is God's disposition, but he allows Moses <clears throat> to stand in the gap and intercede for the people. Um, and it's fine for God to be that way. It's not fine for you and me to be that way, you know. Um, so, but yeah, that, there's, there's, that's your good point. Isn't it? All right, anything else about, oh, the other thing I should say, this is just a detail, but uh, the last time we had water from the rock and God had said hit the rock and he did uh, they called those waters Meribah also I don't know if that means it's the same place it could be I mean if they have to wander you know in the wilderness 40 years maybe they're going around like this I've seen that rock many times before he's like oh, 39 more years you know uh, but um, so and Meribah means quarreling these are the waters of quarreling um, but the last time they had two names, it was quarreling and testing where they tested God, you know, uh, Massa, not Massa, not supposed to say that anymore, uh, but Massa, uh, Massa and Meribah, uh, quarreling and test. So it might be the same, same exact rock, or it might be just same exact situation. You know, they're going to quarrel with me again. All right. Any questions about that or comments or anything? All right, so uh, we're skipping a little bit in chapter 20. We're not done with uh, chapter 20 just yet. But you see the next little passage, uh, the editor calls it uh, in the SV, Edom refuses passage. Now, basically, uh, they're in Kadesh, and Moses uh, sends his diplomats to the king of Edom. Uh, Edom at this time, you know, is a, is a country. Uh, you remember who the Edomites are descended from? Now, let me give you a hint. Edom means red. Yes. So the descendants of Esau are the Edomites. Uh, remember, they are not God's covenant people. Now, God had said he, he doesn't have anything against Esau. It's just um, his promise is going through the line of his brother, Jacob. Jacob. So, but Edom and Israel, not always the best of friends anyway. So they go politely, they go to the king of Edom, can we pass through your land? No. Okay. Now, they're not really on great terms with God as it is, so they decide, okay, then we'll just go around the land of Edom. You know, we got like a whole nother year to do this, since it's the first month. Uh, Edom refuses. So that's... We're just skipping that section, and we're picking up in verse 22. 
Um, let's see. Would somebody, it's not too bad. Would somebody uh, finish the chapter for us, 22 through 29? The whole Israelite community set out from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. At Mount Hor, near the border of Edom, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron will be, will be gathered to his people. He will not enter the land of Get Aaron and his sons to Jazar and take them to Mount Hor. Remember Aaron's garment and put them on his son Eleazar. But Aaron will be gathered to his people and he will die. How far away? Uh, through the end of the chapter, please. Moses did as the Lord commanded. He went up Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community. Moses removed Aaron's garment and put them on his son Eleazar, and Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain, and when the whole community learned that Aaron had died, the entire house of Israel mourned him for thirty days. Okay, thank you. So Aaron has come to the end of his time, and God says. He shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel because you rebelled against my command of the waters of Meribah. Uh, so this is why I think we've gotten, and again, it's not explicit, but I think this is why we are at the end of the wandering. We're in the 40th year uh, because uh, they were getting closer and closer, but he said Aaron will not enter. And it just makes me think that we're, we're pretty close to that time. Um, Moses is going to linger a little while longer till the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, but now, of course, the way that the, the, the high priesthood works at this time is that, uh, remember, the tribe of Levi, that is the, the priestly tribe, but not all Levi, all, all Levites, let me see, not all all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests, okay? Um, so when you read, like, when there's a distinction between Levite and priest, the Levites, they do, they do things, you know, for the worship, and uh, they're, they're, work, they're in the tabernacle and later the temple. But it's like in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember, there's, there's a Levite and a priest. So it's the priestly class that is directly descended from Aaron himself uh, that, that serves in the priesthood, and it's Aaron's sons. That's the succession for the high priest. At this point, Aaron's been the only one, but it's his son Eleazar who's going to be his successor. So this is not how it works now. You know, if you get a new pastor, but, you know, they call him up there. It's like, all right, take off your vestments, put them on that guy. I guess Aaron died of a kind of cold, probably. <laughs> I mean, he's naked. Um, but uh, it's his son Eleazar who takes over the priesthood because that's how the priesthood works in the Old Testament. Uh, and very explicitly, he dies because of his rebellion. They come down, Eleazar is the new high priest, and all the congregation mourns for Aaron 30 days. All right. Anything about that? As we continue into 21, we're going to skip this part about Arad. Uh, there's a lot of fighting at this point. Uh, they're, they're moving, you know, to Canaan. When they get to Canaan, you know, Moses will die and Joshua will be the leader of the people. And we'll have the conquest of Canaan, which we talked a little bit about. We'll probably talk about it again. Uh, it, it causes modern people a little bit of consternation that God says, drive out these people and kill them because this land is yours. Uh, so we can, we'll revisit that if you want to when we get there. But, you know, you do have to remember that Israel is not just like a church, but it is a, it's a kingdom, you know, it's a nation. So uh, they have the power of the sword, you know, in that way too. And honestly, the people that they're dispatching are not good people. They're not nice people. Uh, they're people who, you know, sacrifice their children and commit sexual immorality. And, huh, that's an interesting parallel. Uh, these people get what they deserve, okay? <laughs> Uh, to say that's what God's word says. So anyway, um, so they have this fight with Arad at the beginning of 21. And that's because, and, and to be fair, this time, this is not a war of aggression, okay, because Arad came to them. He finds them, they're at Mount Hor, so he's like, they're on the mountain, I'm going to go kill them, you know, because they, they've taken two weeks off of work, you know, because the queen is dead. 
so they're not expecting what's about to happen. So they come and uh, they fight with uh, the people of Israel. Uh, but the Lord, it says at the end of three, heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites. Um, and remember, Canaanites a catch-all word for these people. Uh, and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah, which means destruction. So we're going to pick up then verse four. Unless you want to say anything about that. But we're getting to the main event for chapter 21, the bronze serpent. Somebody read the story of the bronze serpent for us, please. Verses four through nine. From the Mount of Mount Horeb, they set out on their way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless people. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made the bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, <clears throat> he would look at the bronze serpent and live. All right, thank you. Same old thing. The same song, second verse, a little bit longer, a whole lot worse. <laughs> Once again, God just, he just delivered them from Arad. They're going to go around Edom because that's what they have to do, right? They're going to go from Mount Horeb. They got to go around Edom. And we know why, because the king of Edom said, don't come through my land. So they're trying to be nice, you know, trying to obey the immigration laws. And uh, so they're doing that. And then... It says they grow impatient on the way. And you look at the complaint this time. Again, there's still that accusation. You're trying to kill us. Uh, for there is no food and water. Gee, except the stuff that rains down from heaven. Except the stuff you get out of the rock, you know. Uh, and we loathe this worthless food. Um, and I don't want to be gratuitous in my language, but uh, I did look, I've looked at this passage in, in the languages before. Worthless carries more of the idea of accursed. So they're saying, we hate this damn food. The one that God sends down from heaven for you, that has sustained you for 40 years? Okay. <laughs> Ungrateful people. Uh, so God, like a good father, he says, I'll give you something to complain about. And uh, fiery serpents come. And uh, what fiery means is not entirely clear. I did give you this note. I think this is page two. Uh, fiery in the Hebrew is the word seraph. Now, uh, usually we don't say the word seraph, we say seraphim, because that's the plural. The seraphim, you know, those angels, uh, the heavenly beings, uh, there, are, there are different orders of angels. People don't know this sometimes. They think there's just like a uh, blonde-haired Swedish-looking girl angel with the wings on top of the Christmas tree. I've never found any women angels in the Bible, actually, but uh, there, there do seem to be different orders of angels, and some of them come in the form of men, like we've met Gabriel and Michael before, uh, but there are, there are cherubim, which apparently are different than seraphim. The first cherub, and that's not Raphael's cherub, right? The little angels in the baby butts. No, it's not that. <laughs> They're not cute. You don't want to see one. Um, the, there, there's a cherub with a flaming sword, you know, that guards the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve eat the fruit, kick them out. Uh, but Isaiah, when he's in the temple, he sees the vision of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, he sees the Lord on his throne, and it's the cherubim, or the seraphim, that encircle the throne. They have six wings. They cover their faces in the presence of God, and they say, holy, 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 three, sorry, three times, uh, is the Lord God Almighty, as we sing in the liturgy. Um, and uh, so, and there's actually, it seems that there are even more orders than that. Uh, that Paul talks about the powers, the thrones, the virtues, the dominions. 
all of these different orders of angelic beings. And angel really is not their name, right? Angel means messenger. So the ones that he sends, like Gabriel and Michael, those are angels. Does that mean that in their actual form, you know, they could be cherubim or seraphim, I guess, you know. But uh, there are many different kinds of, you know, spiritual and supernatural beings. Uh, but it's interesting that these snakes, they're called seraphim. Okay. So I don't know if that means, does that mean that like the angelic seraphim, or they just look like they're on fire, you know, which would make sense because people are always terrified of angels. Uh, or is there something snaky looking about seraphim? I guess that's possible. My favorite one is maybe these, these this is not your garden variety of snake. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of scary venomous snakes in the world, but it, maybe this one is like a dragon. Like he breathes fire. Okay. Uh, these are really nasty snakes. I suppose it's possible that maybe the bite is very fiery because they're obviously poisonous. I never can remember. Is a snake venomous or poisonous? Okay. It says venomous. Okay. Because, like, I always forget the, what the difference is, like, you know, you touch the, the toad that's poisonous. It's just that contact that gives you the poison. But you have to be bitten, I think, by something. something I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, you don't want to be bit by a snake, okay? <laughs> so maybe it's that. Maybe the bite just burns like hell. Or maybe they are breathing fire. Or maybe they look, I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting, isn't it? It's the word seraph. He sends the fiery serpents among them. You don't want to eat my food? Okay. Uh, what is the solution? Uh, these snakes, and there must have been a lot. Because remember, we said that uh, Israel probably numbers about a million people. For them to like be going through and like just picking people off, ooh, that's just gross. Uh, but they don't all die. Some are fortunate. They go to Moses, right back to Moses. You know, I talk all this trash about God, and then I get in a rut in my life. I'm like, God, uh, maybe I should go back to church. Pray to the Lord that he may take the serpents from us. So Moses does. He prays for the people. Verse 8, this is God's solution. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. There's a lot there. The first question that I always ask is, well, why didn't he just say, like, just repent, you know, and I'll heal you. But he makes something. And this kind of goes back to uh, what we were saying a little earlier about how God uses means to accomplish things. I think at the surface level, this is kind of a bizarre cure you know, for being bitten by a snake. You're going to make an image of a snake, put it on a pole, and look at it. That's a lot of trouble, you know, just to get healed of like a snake bite. Uh, but God always works in this way that's sacramental. The sacraments don't really begin with baptism and communion. Uh, when you read the Old Testament, God, he always uses physical things to convey his grace and forgiveness of sin and, and literally life, you know, like we see here. Um, to his people. I mean, they had a whole sacrificial system, you know. If you had to kill the animal, shed the blood, you'd receive the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and God does this all the time. Uh, he, he uses actual, physical, material things that in and of themselves would do nothing. But he uses it like as a, as a means and a conduit uh, because we are material and physical. Uh, what he does now, you know, he, Water becomes baptism, bread and wine, or Jesus' body and blood. It's the spoken and the written word that he uses to create faith. I mean, it's really amazing. You know, paper and ink can convey salvation to you. The human voice, you know, it rattling off your eardrum gives you faith. Faith comes by hearing. So this is kind of a sacrament to them. Uh, that he, and the other thing is it's an image. We've talked before how there are some of our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't like pictures in churches. And I think we went through the Ten Commandments. I think they're misinformed. I think they misunderstood the commandment. But you know what they say, you know, graven image. He said, don't make them. I was talking to somebody, a member. He had a relative come visit. 
and uh, relative is not a Lutheran. And he said he was in Luther Hall, and he's like, I'm showing him the picture over here of Luther, the Diet of Worms, talking about how he stood, you know, on the Word of God, they reformed the church, did all this stuff, really talking about Martin Luther. They go in and sit down at church. Guy's relative goes, sees that giant crucifix, and he goes, well, he didn't reform everything, did he? <laughs> Because he didn't like, apparently, this guy thought, you know, the Bible teaches you can't have any kind of, you know, symbolic, you know, religious images. I think that's wrong. We went over that before. But I think one of the greatest proofs that we can, actually, is because God said, make an image. He said, do it. And the image has power. Now, I'm not saying that means that crucifix has power. It does in the sense that, like, it's a visual, you know, proclamation of the gospel. But this one, this is a sacrament, okay? This is going to save these people. Make the image, put it up there, do something physical with it. Look at it, and he who looks on it will live, okay? God does like images. Now, what ends up happening, though, is they save the bronze serpent. They're like pastor. They save everything. And uh, I am trying to clean. I really am. The house cannot get cluttered because, bam, people just keep giving us toys. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, if you have, that's fine. But uh, uh, some other people in our lives are like, you don't have to bring stuff. But anyway, uh, fine, I got a trash can. But uh, I'm being mean today. Uh, I gave you, let's skip some of this. I do want to come back to it, but just because I mentioned it. What happens to the bronze serpent? So in, in fairness. All right. Yes, John. Let me, I'll stop for a minute. Oh, well, I wanted to go before you went. You going to rebuke me? What's that? I wanted to say something before you go ahead. Right okay. Yeah, please. Go ahead. The Israelites asked the guy to take the snakes away. Yes. I didn't take the snakes away. He's back. That's right. I don't know whether they were warm or left of them or whatever. But they were still biting the people. Yes. And, and, but they would still live. But don't you love it? They had to go through the fight. Yes. Maybe they got bit multiple times. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you, when you put your tent there over by, you know, to the front end of the street, and the snake, uh, you know, so that when you do get bit, you're uh, right there to take care of you. And this is, this, I love this story so much. It really actually says something, too, about what God does to save us. Uh, our being saved from sin and death and the devil, that does not mean we get out of it. I mean, there, there's no condemnation. Like Moses, we're still going to face some consequences. I mean, we, like, we've been cleansed of our sins, but there are residual effects, you know? Even though you've been forgiven, when you get the lifetime limit of chemo, it's nothing wrong with you, but it's going to kill you, right? I mean, that's what's going to happen. We're all going to die unless the Lord comes again. Even though he's taking care of our death, we're not going to ever die eternally. And even bodily death, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, Christ is risen. And uh, he's going to give us that resurrection. And like he said, you're just falling asleep. You know? Uh, but yeah, he doesn't say, now your problems go away. The snakes go back into their holes. You know, you'll get bitten. Uh, but don't worry. Like, when they bite you, you get to look at the, the serpent and then you'll live. And there's, there's a very profound truth in that, I think. The other thing is God's a little P.O. You know? <laughs> it's like, just... Go ahead and get it. You know, maybe that'll teach you the next time. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's a great point. Um, I think that's so good. What happens, though, to the snake? Unless you want to say anything about that. And this is, th I'm sorry, this is really actually very important for when we understand being a Christian uh, will not make your life easier. It'll probably make your life worse in the eyes of the world. It'll make your life more difficult. And it's not just because now we have like an hour and a half that, you know, I have to go to church on Sunday. Uh, but uh, it, it's tough. We've heard a lot recently in our readings about the cost of discipleship. I mean, we heard about St. Luke. I forgot to ask you about the sermon. But uh, St. Luke, you know, uh, the consequences that he and Timothy and Paul face, you know, for preaching the gospel, uh, it'll make your life worse, actually. Uh, the great thing is, though, we know that God brings us through those things. He preserves us. And these things actually, whether we ever can see them or appreciate them or not, these are the very things that actually are good for us and strengthen our faith. Um, 
and then we're all, we are all ultimately delivered, right? That's what Paul said in the epistle that we heard. I know that he will deliver me from every evil deed, and he'll bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That's the seventh petition, deliver us from evil. How does he do it? He kills Paul, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's what, you know, that is the deliverance. That's the rescue from evil. We're not going to lose either way. We're going to be delivered. And thank God, when the time comes, he's going to take me, like we say in the catechism, out of this veil of tears and sorrow and bring me to his heavenly kingdom where I'll be with him forever. And that's like being bitten by the serpent, right? Uh, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be that rapture nonsense. You get out, no, you're never going to face anything bad, no consequences. Life is just like as pick, pick a chunks, you know, little affair where I get everything that I want, you know. It'll be the polar opposite of all of that. And it'll actually be through the cross and through the trial and through the suffering that he finally brings us uh, into his kingdom. So that's today's sermon. Um, but it's true. You find it to be true in your own life, don't you? Uh, and that does sometimes mean we need to look at these things a little different. There's a, there's a place to mourn and to lament. And there's also a place that somehow... Even Peter and John, you remember when they get the mess beat out of them by the Sanhedrin? They say, all right, guys, now no more. No more healing or preaching in Jesus' name. And they're like, we got to obey God. So they get beat, then they get let go. And it says that they rejoiced that they were found worthy to suffer for the name. And that's something that just has to be caught. It can't really be taught, you know. Uh, but... There's, there is a certain joy in those things. Anything about that? I wouldn't wish it on you. I don't wish it on myself. But when it happens, it happens, all right? And then we, you come through on the other side. Preferably in my sleep. Preferably in your sleep, yeah, for sure, for sure. That would be nice. Yeah, that, that would be nice. But, but you know, and, and then again, and you all maybe have experienced this too. Um, sometimes it's such a wonderful thing to be able to watch somebody die. I think I'm weird. Uh, but uh, you, get to, you get to see and to hear things that otherwise you might not. You really, one of the, somebody said to me one time, he's another pastor, he said, you know, one of the benefits of our profession is you get to see how people really are because you watch them die. And I don't mean that in a morbid way, uh, but it really is true um, that uh, there have been so many times at somebody's deathbed. Yeah, sometimes there's some deathbed conversions, but a lot of times what you see is there's some repentance for sin because this person, now I'm confronted with the reality, I'm coming to the end, and I am suffering, um, and I know that some things need to be made right. Uh, you get to watch somebody suffer well sometimes, and to suffer in faith, and it's actually a very heroic thing. Um, and I'm not look. I'm not. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with palliative care or morphine or comfort care. Um, that there's nothing wrong. I don't think with those things. But to watch somebody in a prolonged way die as a Christian um, can be a very beautiful and a, and a life-giving thing for them and for you. Uh, my grandmother, you know, who died in August. She finally forgave somebody that she was holding a member of our family. And I talked to her. I said, look, I said, you have to forgive her. I told her that a couple years ago. I said, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to be forgiven. And she goes, yeah, well. <laughs> she did it on her deathbed. Uh, and we have to go through these things. Um, like I said, you don't choose them. You don't choose your cross. But this is why we hear God's word. And we're prepared for those things. And that's why I go on and on. I'll keep going on and on when it comes up in the lectionary. I've got to talk to you about persecution. I have to talk to you about how the world hates you. They want to kill you. Uh, they want to kill babies, which is evil and vile and diabolical. And you have to vote against Proposal 3. Um, you do. You have to. If you're going to vote, you have to do it. Um, <laughs> you can't support the murder of babies and be a Christian. I have to tell you those things. Um, and now you can say it's, it's gloom and doom, doom today. And I hope that y'all never see it. I hope I don't see it. I hope my children don't see it. But you have to be prepared for when it does come. Okay. When they're going to all throw us in jail. Uh, 
I have to tell you those things. So, anyway. So we talk a lot about suffering and death and blood, you know, don't we? <laughs> but it's not because we have this fixation on it. It's because these things are life-giving. Um, it's because God, God in Jesus Christ enters into all of those things, into hopelessness, into death, into agony, into sin, into suffering, because that's the only way to bring us out. That's the only way to get your attention. Okay, that's the only way he can do it. There is no other way. And, that, and that's why we have a, a giant image of a naked man dying on a cross, because there's nothing more important than all of that. Actually, so let's not talk about the fate of the bronze serpent yet. Um, what I want to talk to you about, uh, and this is still on verse 2. Like I said, bizarre story, you know, the way that God works. Uh, Jesus, apart from being the Son of God, is such a genius because he takes this story and he makes it proclaim the gospel. So in John chapter 3, that's where Nicodemus comes to him by night. And Jesus is telling him all this stuff. He's got no idea what he's talking about. You must be born again. You got to be born again of water in the spirit, another sacrament uh, to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, I don't understand anything that you're saying. And Jesus seems genuinely um, perturbed. He says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things. So he uses the Old Testament to show Nicodemus what he's talking about. Now, you know, John 3. The other thing we know John 3 for, John 3.16. Um, and sometimes we kind of take John 3.16, you know, and they put it on a bumper sticker or those signs that they hold up at, you know, a football game. But if you look at the context of it, because I gave you John 14, or uh, verses 14 and 15, uh, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So lifted up. Just like the serpent. He's draped over the wood. Uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. And then we get John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, not die, but have eternal life. So, Jesus is saying, you know what, what ultimately this points to? What happened with Moses is we were all snake bit, right? We are all bit by the snake. We all had His venom coursing through our body. We're going to take two more steps before we drop dead. Conceived and born in sin. And God gives us the solution. And the solution is you have to look upon the one who's lifted up. Right? Now, we can't physically see him. We weren't, weren't alive back then. But well, he's talking about faith. You have to look upon the Son of Man who's lifted up on the cross. So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You will not die. That snake will not kill you. He will bite you, uh, but he won't kill you because you've looked upon the cross of Jesus in faith. Uh, and that's just beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful the way that, that Jesus, because the Bible is all about him, he can take anything and he just makes it sing the gospel. You know, that now that story, you can't read it any other way. Now it's about, it's a type, it's a prophecy, it's whatever you want to call it, of looking forward you know, to what Christ himself will do. And that's why, you know, it goes to the trouble. I'm not just going to zap you and heal you, but you're going to look. You're going to have to make make this thing, this image, look at it and live. It's so. amazing going through the Bible the way we have how many references myself personally that I didn't know referred to the cross from, you know, Old Testament to New like that. It, it just amazes me. There's so many more than, you know, anybody that doesn't take the time to analyze it a little bit will read right past it. You know, sure. Not, not see that or know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean... And it you, makes, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. It makes that understanding and maybe even belief of the Old Testament a little more plausible, I think. Yeah, I think so. I... You, you have to, to to fully mine like what the New Testament is about. You've got to know the Old Testament. I mean, they knew it all. You know, obviously Jesus did, but like the apostles, they didn't have any New Testament. So they knew it well, and they understand these things that he's claiming. Whereas we, uh, now that we don't know anything, I mean, I went to Sunday school, and hopefully 
read the Bible every day like we've been talking about. You come to Bible class. But like they knew that was their Bible. Um, and Luther himself, you know, his day job, he was not a parish pastor. He was ordained, but um, his expertise was Old Testament. And Luther was very serious. He's like, part of our problem as Christians is we don't really know what's going on because we don't know the Old Testament. And when you compare it, like most of God's word is Old Testament, you know. Now, it's fulfilled in the new. It, you, you can't, you can have, I guess you could say, all right, like the Gideon Bible, you can have the new without the old, if that was your only Bible, but you can't have the old without the new, you know. Um, so all those things need to be kept in perspective. But it's so foundational, you know. Have you ever watched The Jewish Jesus on TV? No. Anybody? It's pretty interesting. I've really only seen it a couple of times. Is it a show or a movie? It is a, on TV, and okay. I was browsing, and I came across it, and that's how it spanked the title, The Jewish Jesus. But it is about a Jewish rabbi who believes the New Testament mm -hmm. and preaches it. So it's kind of interesting knowing that he's Jewish, but really what I get out of him when I have watched him is he's just another pastor. I mean, I just another good, but it's interesting to me that he's Jewish and he does bring that flavor into his um, sermons, but um, I had just wondered if anybody had ever came across it browsing. And I've seen it during the day, so it's probably been one of my PJ at home days <laughs> can watch TV and browse. So, oh. uh, again, I've only seen it two different times. But if I will see it come across, I will continue to watch it. And if you cross it, you may find the same, you know, you may. And if I can get the channel or any more information about it, I will so okay. that I can get it to you. Sure, you can yeah. Check it out for yourself. I went, I went one time to a Messianic uh, Jewish synagogue. Messianic Jews are, are Jews who believe in Jesus, and such, and they're, they're Jews for Jesus. Yeah, Jews for Jesus is a main. Ooh, ooh. Um, but uh, yeah, and they're trying to hold on, you know, to their Jewish culture and things like that. It's interesting. So, but maybe but they appreciate more what's in here because they know all of this stuff pointed towards him, mm -hmm. and he's the the fulfillment of all mm -hmm. the promises in the Old Testament, and and. Most of us don't know all those and don't even appreciate yeah, how much right. he, he gave so many predictions. I mean, even Satan should have seen it. You know, he's got to be killed at, at Passover time because he's the Passover That's right. lamb and stuff like that. You right. know, but, uh, yeah. you read the New Old Testament as a Jew or Jew, yeah. as being Jewish and not having that prediction or that flavor thrown in it along the way would be weird, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be like opaque or abstract or unflavorful or you see what I'm saying yeah. about that mm -hmm. um, prophecy of what's to come mm -hmm. thrown throughout the Old Testament. We have uh, Lutheran yes, uh, too. People of the book, like, right? Is it yeah. people of Pablo? Yeah, well, no. Oh, no, that's something different. Um, I'm sorry. No, that's something different. Uh, yeah, you're right, though. There is an organization. Yes, in Michigan, even. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I get their, their stuff in the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't think of what they're called right now. Yeah, I know. I think I know, but I can't think of it. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see, though, in the early church, why it was such a big issue. Because they had to iron out, are you? Are you a Jew or are you a Christian? Now, in the succeeding centuries, eventually we do kind of get to there's a difference between these two things. And that's not because of like, th that really, the reason for that is because Judaism itself doesn't stay the same. Uh, there's a certain point where Judaism is not the Old Testament faith, but it is the teaching of the rabbis and it's in, in reaction to what Jesus has come to do. That's not the same religion as the religion of the Old Testament. A lot of Christians are confused about that sometimes. But that is not Old Testament Christianity, right? Um, modern Judaism is not that, right? Modern Judaism is not Old Testament faith. It's something completely different. Because otherwise, like Jesus said, if you had believed Moses and the prophets, you would have been, you would have believed me because the scriptures testify of me. And they don't accept that. Um, 
But the, so one of the problems, and you can kind of see this in the early church, you read the book of Acts, the apostles always go to the synagogue. Now, that makes perfect sense. Because how are you going to go up to a Gentile, you know, Roman, hey, the Messiah has come. And they go, the what? The who? What is sin? <laughs> uh, the God who? Uh, so, so this is, you know, they're not people of the book. You know, they don't, they don't have any expectation. Now, eventually what happens um, is that eventually the message spreads. You know, it goes outside of the synagogue. And a lot of the early converts are, are they've already, they're Gentiles who've already converted to Judaism. And now Judaism is fulfilled, you know, in the coming of Christ himself. But you think about it, it, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you, you don't just walk up to somebody and you're like, mom's plane is going to be here at four. You don't say that to a stranger. You say that to somebody who's expecting mom to come. You say that to somebody who's got the Bible, who's a Jew, you know, who goes to church. Uh, and eventually, you know, the great thing is, then the Gentiles can learn the Old Testament and we can preach to Gentiles and say, hey, guess what? The Messiah has come. And because they converted to Judaism and they went to the synagogue and they went to Hebrew school, they're like, I know what you're talking about. Um, so that's really actually how evangelism worked in, in early Christianity. It's how it works in the book of Acts. Uh, it's not so much uh, I stand on the street corner and anybody who walks by, the Messiah has come. I don't know what you're talking about, you know. So something to be said for going to the synagogue first. <laughs> And then, you know, they come into Christian. I want, well, no, let's read it. I gave you this long quote. Uh, and this goes to something that Sueta said, uh, that uh, there's such a depth in the Bible. There's so many things that you have to read. You got to read over and over again, right? That's what I was try trying to encourage y'all toward and myself toward is a lifelong uh, daily reading of the Bible. And, uh, Read, mark, learn, inwardly digest as we pray. The, the fathers of the early church who lived after the apostles are phenomenal with this. And this is kind of dense, but just look. In brackets, it's got all the reference, the Bible references. But see how, how uh, this is Gregory of Nyssa, lived in the fourth century. Look at how he weaves all of this together, okay? Gregory of Nyssa um, was what we call one of the Cappadocian fathers. And he was one of the defenders of Jesus' divinity and also the divinity of the Holy Spirit in the 4th century. So he comes after the writing uh, of the original Nicene Creed. He had a sister named Macrina, by the way. That's where the name comes from. But look at how he's writing a book called The Life of Moses, which is basically, it's about how does a Christian read the Old Testament? So we'll drink from the fire hose for a minute. He says, the teaching is clear. That remains to be seen. Uh, but he's talking about the devil. For if the father of sin is called a serpent by Holy Scripture, and what is born of the serpent is certainly a serpent, it follows that sin is synonymous with, with the one who begot it. Now, he's making a reference to that promise that God made to Adam and Eve. Remember when he said, or I'm, well, and it comes, he's speaking to the serpent. He says, the, the offspring of the woman will bruise your head. You will bruise his heel. I'll put adversity, enmity between you and the woman, your seed, her seed. So what he's saying is, father of sin, the progenitor of sin is the devil. And the devil has offspring, you know, those who are sinners, those who follow the devil. Uh, they're all serpents, okay? So he's picking up on the serpent part. So, follows that sin is synonymous with the one who begot it. But the apostolic word, so the teaching of the apostles testifies that the Lord was made into sin for our sake by being invested with our sinful nature. Now that passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, that's where St. Paul says that God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus becomes a sinner, but Jesus is identified with sin. He takes the sin of the world on himself and God treats Jesus as if he is sin, right? So, let, let's keep, we're going to tie this together. This figure, and the figure there, uh, he's talking about the serpent, therefore is rightly applied to the Lord. So look how he's reading the Bible. 
For if sin is a serpent and the Lord became sin, the logical conclusion should be evident to all. By becoming sin, he became a serpent. That's he's talking about Jesus. That he might devour and consume the Egyptian serpents produced by the sorcerers. It's a reference to Exodus. So in other words, he's talking, he hasn't said it yet, but the bronze serpent, he's saying that's why it's a serpent. Because Jesus comes and he looks like a sinner. He comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looks like the devil himself, actually. Serpent. Uh, that's why. That's his argument. This is why Moses uses the snake. Because Jesus comes and he becomes sin for us. Kind of neat way of reading the Bible. Uh, this done, the serpent was changed back into a rod. Now remember that now he's, he's all over the place. Good thing you don't know anybody who preaches like this or teaches like this. Now he's talking about, you know, Moses throws down the, the rod, becomes the snake. When he's done with it, picks it back up, right? This done, the serpent was changed back into a rod by which sinners are brought to their senses. <laughs> and that one from Proverbs, you know the, the saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. Got to get whacked with a rod. You'll come to your senses. So he's saying this is what God has done for us in the person of Christ. And those slackening on the upward and toilsome course of virtue are given rest. The rod of faith supporting them through their highest hopes. Uh, now the rod is a good thing. It's not the rod that goes across your butt, but it's the rod that the good shepherd uses to beat off, you know, the lions or the tigers or whatever, the bears, you know, that would eat the sheep. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So you see, he takes everything from the Bible. He's like, anytime I see rod, I'm going to apply that to this. You know, it's not only Moses rod, it's the rod of discipline. It's the rod of the cross. It's the rod of the good shepherd. And anytime I see serpent, it's all right. So where have I seen serpent in the Bible? The devil in the garden of Eden, the, the serpent on the pole that gives me the sin. Jesus took on our sin. And it's just like the entire Bible then opens up. It's kind of chaotic, but it's such a beautiful thing. And something like that, you might have to go home and read it a couple of times to completely get what he's saying. But um, I think that is how we should read the Bible. Uh, and so we have to be devoted to it. Uh, and so again, just like with Jesus, when, he, when he's teaching Nicodemus, it's by making all those associations and knowing that everything is really about Christ and that Christ is at the center, that it just opens up the Bible. It opens up all of the scriptures. Uh, and we see that it, that's what it means for the Bible to be all about Jesus, right? So the Old Testament then is not just long extended introduction and then we get to the good stuff, you know, when Jesus comes, but it all proclaims him because he's there. He's there in the bronze serpent, right? Um, I miss being with y'all, I do have to say. You know, like four weeks is a long time not to do Bible studies. Anything you want to say about any of that? before I come to the end here. Uh, okay. So what does happen to the bronze serpent, though? In fairness to the fellow who doesn't like our crucifix, even though he was wrong, um, we can always take the best things of God and make them into something bad, idolatrous or sinful. And that is what happens with the bronze serpent. They keep the bronze serpent. Centuries later, uh, the people of Israel have strayed very far, and now they're worshiping the bronze serpent. Remember, it's had special powers, right? It's, it's kind of the same error that Moses commits, right? Where he thinks the power's in him, the power's in the staff, the power's in I strike the rock. Uh, they think the same kind of thing, that this in and of itself, you know, is powerful, and it's some kind of conduit to God, you know. Um, so what happens, though, good news is when Hezekiah, second kings, when he becomes the king of Judah, Hezekiah is a great guy. Uh, he kills the prophets of Baal. He institutes a lot of these reforms. Um, they go back to the scriptures. And Hezekiah does something that a lot of the other kings, even the faithful ones, have been reticent to do. It says, and this is uh, page three near the top, Hezekiah removed the high places. Those were, you know, they're up there worshiping the false gods and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. 
And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. So they had turned the bronze serpent into a false god, an idol. They're making sacrifices to it. His name was Nehushtan, uh, which means bronze. It is bronze. It's our God. So you can see how these things can become bad. The thing, the thing, though, to remember and to be fair is why, how have they gotten to the point that they're worshiping the bronze serpent? Because they've abandoned God's word. Okay. So I don't worry about y'all. I mean, I guess it's, I've never met somebody who actually worships the crucifix. Maybe they do. I'm not saying they don't. Um, but, and I don't want to, don't want to be uncharitable, but I, you want to have, you know, nativity scene. You can have a statue of Mary. That's fine. Uh, when the doctrine is wrong, this is what leads to Mary being like, you know, carried on a, whatever you call that thing, and people like bound down to it. Okay. But the problem is not having a statue of Mary. The problem is, it is, is what we believe, is it from God's word? And then, by all means, you know, <laughs> decorate your churches with as many, you know, statues and images as you like. I think it's great. Um, so it's not the image itself that's the problem. And you see, if they had not been idolatrous if they hadn't gone into this you know syncretism they wouldn't have worshipped it they just you know just set it up you know i don't know put it in the temple or something uh that's the problem the abuse is the problem nehushtan really interesting they start worshiping a serpent isn't it just like as gregory of nyssa said the father of sin the serpent um can i tell you a bad story <laughs> Are you going to define bad for us? First? No, that would ruin the fun. Um, you know that I, I don't want to talk poorly of anybody. I would never do that. Uh, certainly not in our synod. But uh, so there we have two seminaries. You know that I'm a Fort Wayne guy through and through. And uh, there are, I think they're both fine institutions. I think Fort Wayne is a, I know I went there, fine institution. I'm, sh I'm sure St. Louis Seminary is a fine institution. Some of the best pastors I ever know is St. Louis Seminary. Um, we are a little different. There's some difference in emphases. And uh, there's always something to stereotypes. But I'll tell you this. You go into the chapel at the Fort Wayne Seminary. And they do on the... Has anybody been to Kramer Chapel? Kay has been. Well, you should go. You don't live that far from Fort Wayne. Yeah, Okay. Well, we'll have to, let's let's do a trip sometime. It's like it's under four hours. We can go and go to chapel or something. Um, beautiful, like really impressive uh, building de uh, designed by uh, Saarinen, who also designed um, I think it's the Air Force Chapel and then also the St. Louis Arch. Very nice. It's kind of modernist, which is not my cup of tea, but whatever. Um, they've got this big, big, you know, and it's just a plain cross on the back wall, you know, the chancel. But they do have like a nice processional crucifix, do processions like we do here on special day. And uh, that's all very good. If you go to the, the chapel in St. Louis, let me see if I can draw this. They also have a very large cross. Is that a mark? That's way up on top. Yeah, we have three-year-olds that love to get into that. Yeah, you gotta hide those. Now, this is this is no exaggeration. If you go into the the chapel at the St. Louis Seminary, you got a cross, um, and this is made out of, I would say, bronze. There's a squiggle like this, and a squiggle like this. Uh, like, it's too, like, I don't know what it's made out of. It's not exactly wire. It's a little bigger than that. So I go and I visit, you know, when I'm going to visit the seminary. And I'm like, what is that? I mean, it looks like there's, like, two pieces of, like, bronze-colored spaghetti, like, on a cross. I'm like, I just don't get it. And uh, the tour guide said to me, well, that's called the serpentine cross. I said, oh, what's the symbolism behind that? And uh, um, they were like, well, you know, the story of the bronze serpent in the wilderness. I was like, oh, the guy I was with 
He's like, so this is the, the chapel of the snake god. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, you know what happened to it? Like it became an idol and they destroyed it and all of that. So I'm not lying when I say this. That kind of clarified my decision. Not, not because I don't think that they're worshiping, you know, Nehushtan. But if you want to know, if, if you're like, what's the difference between St. Louis and Fort Wayne? Um, compare this to the crucifix in our sanctuary. And the one that speaks to you will tell you, you know, if you went to seminary, which one you go to. <laughs> okay? I don't think I, that's the parable. I don't think I have to say anything else. But that's just how it is. And I'm not like opposed to like, you know, different kinds of art. I do kind of think in a church though, it, it shouldn't require that much interpretation because then we're moving from like a Christian image into something that's that's more art than it is, you know, teaching you something. That's just my opinion. I don't think they're sinning. Whoever made that awful thing though, I think, I don't know. Uh, I think it's awful. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It reminds me of, of the way the drawings were in the, in the 60s, like Mm -hmm. And I'm not, yes, I think it's a very 60s, a very modernist, you know, kind of thing. And I, again, I think there's a place for all kinds of art. Uh, but yeah, and I would, I'd be interested to know what is the vintage of that? Like, how old is the Serpentine Cross? Because I don't know. Um, but <laughs> so that's my mean story for the day, the Chapel of the Snake God. Uh, and we got seven minutes. Um, well, let's, I don't want to start something new. Well, this will be a whole lot of fun though. Next week, we'll start Balaam. Uh, you'll like, you'll like the story of Balaam. Before we go, because we did things out of order. I know your minds are full of many things now. Some, some edifying and some maybe not. But, um, is there anything that you want to talk about in the time that we have about the sermon, about St. Luke? If you want. He was a doctor. He was a doctor, yes. St. Paul calls him the beloved physician. Yes. And, you know, being like an evangelist, I would definitely want to go to St. Luke. You know, I'm like, you, you got the natural remedy, but I'm like, I know you can heal. So, <laughs> it'd be better than having to go through radiation, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, he was. Well, by, by their standard, he was a physician. St. Paul says he's the beloved physician in Colossians. But what is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment? Uh, the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in everything we do. Yeah, I don't think that's the fifth commandment. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. Shall not murder. Have you ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? The book? The book or the Bible verse. Or yeah. Whatever. The book, yeah. though, says at the end of that prayer, um, it says, because it's a prayer of this man, Jabez, to the Lord, and the prayer goes, um, and keep your hand on me, or keep me safe, so that, keep me safe from harm. I can't even remember. But the last part of it was, so that I may not cause harm. So the whole point was of that was to keep your hand of safety on me or keep your hand of protection on me so I don't cause harm to others. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was kind of a unique way to think about that because when you ask for safety or protection, you don't think about it in that way. You think about it for yourself, but not so that you don't cause it to somebody else. Kind of reminds me of the um, our uh, our prayer, the, you know, about trespassing, so that you know, the Lord's prayer. <laughs> Duh. Mm -hmm. That that one, that one. <laughs> well, I guess it depends. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. Yeah, usually what we think. I I always try to say a little prayer when I get in the car. I usually the word from the Psalms, the Lord will protect you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And I pray that and we always think, I'm thinking about me, but it's also a prayer, it should be, for the other driver, for the pedestrian, maybe for the deer, I don't know. <laughs> just just don't hurt me or my car when I run that thing. Um, but yeah, that's true. And a lot of times, isn't that like, 
the story of our lives, sometimes we need to say, God, I need, I need you to get me out of the way so I don't screw this up anymore, you know, and be gracious and merciful to me. Uh, but even, you know, John the Baptist, that's what he says. When Jesus' fame grows and he's out and he's preaching and his disciples are baptizing and they come to, you know, John's disciples like, well, what do you think of that? And John says, well, that's what it's all about. He must increase and I must decrease. And sometimes that ought to be our prayer. You know, I do need to decrease and I need to make sure that you protect the other driver or yeah. my passenger or whoever. It's just another so. way that maybe when you're praying to add on. Because now whenever I do pray for protection or safety or then I do think about that too, you know, so mm -hmm. that I may not cause it for, for somebody else. Also. Yeah. So. yeah. And that's also part of the reason that, you know, we... We want to be faithful. We want to guard our lips. We want to we want to live the way that God says. Not only you know for my benefit, but because we do have this influence on other people, and we don't want to we don't want to hold God as less than holy by our sins, you know, and by our behavior. And rather, you know, because we don't want to lead anybody else astray, right? You don't want to be a jerk. Okay. <laughs> my dad said one time. I don't know where he got this, but he said the gospel is offensive enough without our help. That's true. The world already hates the gospel. They think it's a bunch of nonsense. They don't believe a man can die for the sins of the world. So that being the case, they're already offended enough. All right. Like St. Paul says, the cross of Jesus is uh, foolishness to the Greeks. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. So don't be a jerk. Okay. Don't do that. Um, it's really hard for some of us. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. So with that admonition, um, let's uh, close with prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we are bound to thank and to praise you uh, that you enter into our world uh, in the person of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, uh, that you do use the physical and the material, that you use human flesh and blood to redeem and to save us. We thank you that our Lord Jesus, like the serpent in the wilderness, was lifted up on the cross. We thank you that you forgive us of our rebellion um, and our quarreling and grumbling against you and those whom you have appointed to preach the word to us. We ask uh, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would gladly attend to your word, uh, that you would help us to live in the evil days in which uh, you have called us to. We pray also um, that you would guide us uh, in our travel as we go home into the places that we will go. We pray that you would order our steps, uh, that we would hear and obey your word, and that above all, we would always trust in the grace of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Glad to be